If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. If you're using the Pew Bible, it's page 902. 902. This morning at our Easter sunrise, uh, Jay shared about uh, Mary Magdalene's experience at the grave. The first woman to to speak with and touch the risen Lord. Um, just amazing. I don't know if, if you were here or if you had opportunity to see uh, the Passion of the Christ that was here this Friday. A number of us came, and thank you, Bruce, wherever you are, for, for getting that set up. That was, it just moves you. I, it just is amazing to sit here and watch what our Lord went through. And I know it's perhaps a dramatization, but um, maybe it wasn't even real enough that movie of just exactly what took place there on that Friday for you and I as the Lord, the God of the universe, went to the cross. That kind of reminds me of what it might have been like. Um, but it's empty. He's no longer there. Um, <clears throat> so John chapter 20, I'm going to start at verse 19 and read to the end of the chapter. John chapter 20, starting at verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the 12 disciples, Nick, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were get together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Now, my Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs into it, in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Um, may God bless his word to us today. The resurrection... That Sunday evening, the film depicted them hiding in the room. Um, Tina and I watched one yesterday called The Bible, and they, did, they depicted that as well. But Sunday, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, I believe the most important day in the life of the church. It is what gives validity to us as a church, as a Christian people. Had it not been a resurrection, we would... We would not be a church. We might be meeting, but it wouldn't be the body of Christ. But because it's, there is a resurrection Sunday, we have validity to gather together to celebrate what took place nearly 2,000 years ago. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 to 19. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, says, But tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. 
In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. That was Paul's declaration to the church at Corinth. If there is no resurrection, you are still in your sins. That's how important Resurrection Sunday is to us. And we need to be convinced of it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And there are those who are continually trying to deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus. What are the proofs? So I thought we'd look at some of the proofs that we have from Scripture um, and outside perhaps that, that give validity to the resurrection story. There is the eyewitness account. And as Jay spoke of this morning, the women were the first, Mary Magdalene. And think about it. He shared this morning that in the culture of Jesus' day, a woman's word was not to be taken as proof for anything. Um, so for Jesus and to, to make himself known to a woman was just unheard of. And all four gospel writers include that in their story of the resurrection. It was the women. It was the woman that, that had the testimony, the eyewitness account. Um, and we know that these women were a part of the disciples group. In Acts chapter 1, when they were in the upper room praying, it, said, it names all the disciples, and it says, and the others, including the women. So these women were devout followers of Jesus. And it was amazing that he would uh, um, make himself known to women. But there's also the testimony of Peter, right? It wasn't just to the women, but it says this in Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 33. And this is kind of the follow-up of um, the, the disciples from Emmaus who were walking home. And this unknown person joined their group and was talking about what happened and sat down to break bread. And suddenly they became aware it was Jesus himself. And so for seven miles at the end of the day, they rushed back to Jerusalem and, and we pick it up. And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem, it says in Luke 24. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. And I thought about just the, the sensitivity of Jesus to, to visibly show Peter that he was alive. I think of that story of the crucifixion. It was it was Peter who was told by Jesus he's going to deny him three times before the rooster crows. And in one of the gospel writers' accounts, Peter denied with curses. And Jesus looked and he saw him look and the rooster crowed. And suddenly it came back to Peter's mind. It's exactly what Jesus said. And the Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. And now here, I can only imagine how Peter must have felt denying his Lord when he had vehemently said, I would never, I'll, I'll die for you. But Jesus knew what was going to happen. And yet with that sensitivity that only the Lord can express, he shows himself to Peter after he was raised from the dead. Um, that, that just encourages my heart. But there's more. We read in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 6, after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Paul is saying that when Jesus rose from the grave, there was over 500 together at one time who witnessed his resurrection, who saw him alive from the dead. And some of those were still living when, when Paul wrote this account, this testimony to the church at Corinth. So you would think if it was fabricated, it was, a, it was simply a story, Paul would never have written it down, knowing that there were some people alive who could have disputed his claim and called him a liar. But they never did. Um, even, even the chief priests and the scribes had to admit that the tomb was empty. When it came to their ears, that the, the tomb was emptied by the guards who had been struck to, down in, in the presence of the angel. What was it that the priest told the guards to say? Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. That was all they had to express what had happened. Uh, and that could have resulted in their death for the guards had that come to the ears of Pilate. 
to think that they who were there to watch the tomb would have fallen asleep. Um, but even the priest go on record as saying the tomb is empty. So, so just tell them that the disciples stole the body. And we'll, we'll be good. We'll stand good for you. We'll, we'll make sure if it comes to Pilate's ears that we'll um, see you don't get punished for it. So just those give great credibility to the fact that the tomb is empty. And then let's talk about the empty tomb. Um, you know, you, you think it, they've been rejecting the story of the resurrection for now nearly 2,000 years. And all that those who don't believe in the resurrection need to do is to, is to present the tomb with the body, with the bones of Christ. And that would, that would challenge and uproot the Christian story. But in all this time, they've not been able to present a body to say it belongs to Jesus. And one thing that amazes me in thinking about the empty tomb was how it changed the disciples. Remember when Mary Magdalene came and told Peter and the disciples that the, that the Lord is risen? It says that, that Peter and the, and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, we, it's in the gospel according to John, ran to the tomb. John was faster, he got there first, but he didn't go in. He waited outside. Peter came and went right into the tomb, saw the, the wrappings, the clothing laying there, and just marveled about that and went out consider, considering it, thinking about it. And then it says John went into the tomb, saw it, and believed. What did he believe? I'm convinced that he believed that Jesus must have been raised from the dead. He didn't understand it. It wasn't what he was expecting, but he believed the commentary that I have says that in part he must have believed in the resurrection story. And maybe because of the way that the, the, the wrapping of Jesus, the shroud was laying uh, just like a cocoon. It wasn't unwrapped. It was laying there in the form of a body. And it says that the, the, the napkin that was covering his head was in a folded in a place by itself. I don't know what the significance all of that is, but it must be something important. The fact that the gospel writers would include that in the story that the napkin around his head was folded in a place by itself. Someone told me some time ago that in the culture of that day, when they invited guests or there was a special occasion and a number of guests were at the table having a meal together, if one of the guests got up to leave the table, if they were finished with the meal, they would just lay the napkin on a pile. But if they were intending to come back, they would fold it up, the napkin, and lay it there. So the folks who had the, were giving the banquet would know that that guest is returning. Could that be why the napkin was folded in a place by itself? I don't know. But it sure kind of adds some interesting thoughts about the subject. But it, it changed forever the disciples and how they responded once they saw the risen Christ and knew that the tomb was empty. Up until this point, they were hiding in an upper room, it says, locked behind the doors. Two weeks in a row in John chapter 20, it talks about them being inside with the doors locked. And Jesus came into their midst. Thankfully, a week later, Thomas was there and saw it all. But up until then, until the Holy Spirit came, these disciples were gripped with fear of what might happen if the Jews would find them, if the priests and scribes and the leaders, they wanted to crush this, this faith, this group of, of believers. Uh, but when the Holy Spirit came, it changed them, and they were no longer afraid even to die. Uh, and they boldly proclaimed the risen Lord. Uh, then there's the prophecy of the Old Testament that adds validity to the resurrection story. Just one, Psalms chapter 16 and verse 10 says, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. That Psalm is written by David and you know, you could say, well, he may be even writing about himself. So how does that give power to the resurrection story? Well, if, it, if, if that's the only place you find it, then maybe you could make that argument. But it's not the only place that particular scripture is found. In the New Testament, um, on the day of Pentecost, Peter uses that scripture to, to declare to the people that, that Jesus, this was speaking about Jesus. 
And let me just read that from Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 22. Peter is preaching his first message, Pentecost Sunday, and he says, People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. King David said this about him. I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praise. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. Psalm 16, 10. You have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with joy of your presence. Peter goes on, dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and was buried and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet and knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. Um, that's... That just changes that scripture completely when you see that it was met as a prophecy of the resurrection of the Messiah from Psalm chapter 16 when Peter uses it. Uh, <clears throat> Paul the Apostle also quotes it in Acts chapter 13. Um, and so we know that he, he had, was resurrected. This scripture that was written so many years before had now come to, to be fulfilled on, on Resurrection Sunday. You go to the very end of the book, Revelation chapter 1, when, when John the, the, the Apostle, who was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, was there uh, just trying to survive, and he has a revelation, a vision of Jesus himself coming to him. It says this in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4. John is writing, this letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from one, the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. From the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by the shedding of his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him. Even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. Then in verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died. But look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. The last book of the Bible gives another witness to the resurrection of Jesus. And that he not only is alive, but he is returning. He's coming back. Resurrection, what it's all about. And we need a resurrection to be saved. And unless we believe, we won't be saved. Uh, I was reminded of this this week I, in my devotions. I came across Luke chapter 16, um, a story of the rich man and Lazarus. You might remember that story. Um, and Lazarus, this poor beggar who was laying at the uh, the gate of this rich man, just wanting the crumbs that would fall from his table, it says. But finally, the Lazarus dies, and the angels carry him to Abraham's bosom. And then the rich man died, and he opened his eyes in hell. And he looked across the divide, and there he saw Abraham and Lazarus. And so he pleased with Abraham, just, just send Lazarus and have him dip the tip of his finger in some water and cool my tongue. I'm tormented in this flame. 
And Abraham says, I can't do it. There's, a, there's this big gulf. No one can, can cross this chasm. No one can get to you and you can't get to us. And so this rich man says, but, but Father Abraham, send Lazarus back to my brother. I have five brothers at home. I don't want them to come to this place. What was Abraham's response? But they have the law and the prophets, right? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them read that. They will understand. No, he said, Lazarus said, or the rich man, if only someone who would go back from the dead, then they would believe. And Abraham says, no, they won't. In verse 31 of chapter 16, Abraham says, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. I thought, how true of even the resurrection of Jesus. It doesn't matter how many proofs we have. If people don't want to believe it, you can't, you can't persuade them with all of the proof in the world. They choose not to accept, not to believe. It's a sad reality, but, but, the, but the reality at the end of the day is you and I must make a choice. What do we believe about the resurrection? Some would look at this cross and think that God would send his son who would die on a cross, allow men to do what, what they did to him. That, that movie that we watched together on Friday afternoon, The Passion of the Christ, my heart went out to Jesus' mother as she followed her son on this, this just incredible journey. Of the, the scourging and the beating and the humiliation and the ridicule and the mockery that he endured from, from the Romans, from, from his own Jewish people. To see and to think what a mother's heart must have felt to watch what people did to her son. I, I couldn't imagine that. For me as a father to watch someone do that to one of my sons or grandchildren just tears my heart apart. And yet... That's what happened. I believe Mary understood who Jesus was. She believed. But even that couldn't have softened some of the things that she had to see and witness concerning her son's treatment from the hands of those he created. Just boggles your mind to think of that. And yet even in that day and in up until our day, people would just wave it off as, ah, it was just the culture of the day. That's just the way things were. It doesn't mean that he was the Messiah or is the Messiah. Paul wrote about this in uh, the letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1 and verse 18, where he says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven. And it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended. And the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. Would never have happened that way. God would not give up his son. And yet, the record of scripture would say that is exactly what happened. Because God so loved his creation, so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And on Good Friday, what People say, what was so good about that Friday? Well, that Friday was the day that the debt for sin was paid. That's what made it good. And then Sunday morning, that's the day we celebrate. The grave could not hold him. He came forth. He is risen. Do we believe? That's where it really lies. And that's a decision that only you and I can make. We must choose to believe. And I trust that we have. I trust in some time in our experience, we came face to face with the reality of the cross. And then came resurrection morning. And we, it made sense. And we accepted it and we believed. One of my commentaries on the book of Matthew in chapter 27 and verse 50, I read this. When he had cried out again, meaning Jesus, with a loud voice, he yielded up his spirit the loud cry demonstrates that he died in strength, not in weakness. The fact that he yielded up his spirit distinguished his death from all others. We die because we have to. He died because he chose to. 
Had he not said, I lay down my life that I may take it again? No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. John 10, 17 and, and 18. And then I came with this poem that just um, described it so real. It's written by F.W. Pitt. The maker of the universe as man for man was made a curse. The claims of laws which he had made unto the uttermost he paid. His, ho his holy fingers made the bow which grew the thorns that crowned his brow. The nails that pierced his hands were mined in secret places he designed. He made the forest whence there sprung the tree on which his body hung. He died upon a cross of wood, yet made the hill on which it stood. The sky that darkened o'er his head by him above the earth was spread. The sun that hid from him its face by his decree was poised in space. The spear that spilled his precious blood was tempered in the fires of God. The grave in which his form was laid was hewn in rock his hands had made. The throne in which he now appears was his from everlasting years. But a new glory crowns his brow and every knee to him shall bow. I just like that. That just reinforces what it was all about. And one day you and I will bow before him and declare him Lord and will worship him in his presence eternally. It will be so amazing, so worth it. And I trust you are excited about that day all because of Resurrection Sunday. Because indeed the tomb is empty. Let's pray. Father, This is a, a bittersweet weekend, Lord. Bitter in that what it cost your son as he was nailed to a cross. And the things that his creation did to him. Just, I can't put into words. And the thing that, that drives that point home is if I had been there, would I have been the one to swing the hammer, to hold the nail? It was my sin that held him there. And he stayed on that cross until it was accomplished, as the writer says. To think that, that God would lay aside his glory and his power and his authority and come and take upon himself the form of a man, coming in, becoming a servant, giving his life to die on the cross. On a cross, no less. All because he loved. He loved the Father, and the Father loved the world. And so, this was the only way. There is no one else worthy enough to, to pay for the debt of somebody else, because who will pay their debt? We are all sinners. There is none righteous, the Bible says. No, not one. Except the Son of God. He came holy. Never broke the law. Kept it to the, to the full. And died on a cross. To be the perfect sacrifice. And then Sunday morning. He rose triumphantly from the grave, never, never to die again. He tasted, tasted death so we don't have to. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for revealing that truth, even today, to some, perhaps one, sitting here in this room, that Jesus paid your debt. He died for you, and he rose again. And if you will just believe in him, it's so simple. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 and 10, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. It's a promise. We can declare it. We need to believe it if we ever want to see heaven 
and make it our home. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. Thank you, Jesus, for that way. Thank you that it is that simple, that if we just will believe with our heart, that you, through the power of God, who gave you the authority, raised you from the grave. And as Jay preached this morning, you're seated at your Father's right hand in the heavens, interceding for us, praying for us, declaring before you, his, your Father and the angels, that those who have put their faith in you belong to you. No man can snatch them out of your hand. Where it says, your Father is greater than all and no one no man can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that the grave is empty. And we have more than adequate proof that there was indeed a resurrection. And there will be another one. There will be a resurrection for us, Lord, one day. Perhaps even today, there will be a resurrection into a new body, an immortal body. One that will never decay or die again. And if we die, there will be a new body as we come from the grave that we will inhabit and spend forever with you, Lord. All because of Resurrection Sunday. All because Jesus died and paid the sin. And we can only say thank you, Lord. Here's my life. I give it to you. Lord, I pray if there's one here this morning who's not made that commitment before today, today, Holy Spirit, rebirth them. May they experience a new birth, born into the family of God. The Holy Spirit will testify, will witness with our spirit that we are sons and daughters of the living God, if we will only believe. Thank you, Jesus, that you not only rose and went back to heaven, but you said, if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Thank you for that promise, Lord. It is a hope that keeps us looking up, moving forward ever closer to you, trying to know who you are as we look into your word. Bless, I pray, your people in their midst of struggle whatever experience this day is bringing their way help them always to trust you and to keep that hope in their hearts that you love them that you will keep them that you are coming for them to you we give all honor and glory and praise in Jesus name amen amen let's stand together as we sing Step down from glory to where my 
my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. And Jesus Christ is my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise, the buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the great has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise living hope. I hope you go out of this church today with a smile on your face that nothing can take off. At least today. Tomorrow is another day. But we have hope, beloved. We have hope. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for that living hope. Knowing that the grave is empty and the promise that you're coming back, Lord. And now it's been almost 2,000 years since you made that promise. And we're just believing, Lord, one of these days we're going to going to see that promise fulfilled and could it be in my lifetime wouldn't that be amazing to hear that trumpet sound and and the, the call to come up to come up and in a moment the bible says in a, the twinkling of an eye 
we will be caught up together with those who've gone before to, to join them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we ever be with the Lord. I pray that will be everyone in this room's experience, Lord. And if not, if, if they're not sure, they can be sure today. You are indeed our living hope. Thank you for this opportunity to gather this Resurrection Sunday and to celebrate once more what this day means. Lord, if you're willing and you tarry, bring us back next Sunday when we'll celebrate again. We'll gather together and know that you are in our midst. I pray, Father, for those who are sick, those who are in the hospitals, those who are expecting um, tests and, and um, procedures. Father, give them your peace. Put inside their hearts your living hope that you care about them, that you died and that you will keep them. Now, Lord, go with us as we go and gather families and friends, whatever it might be this day. May we just have that hope visible on our expressions and in our language, our discussions, our fellowship. May there be joy in our words and, and love and kindness toward one another, we pray in Jesus' name. And now may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.